Good evening, Lord Mayor, members of the Oireachtas, ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mary Rose Burke. This is my first year here at this event as CEO of Dublin Chamber. So I'm delighted to see you all here this evening. Welcome, Kays Mila Falcha. We have a wonderful evening lined up for you, uh, some great speakers, and I do promise we'll keep the formalities short so that you can enjoy the company of your guests and your colleagues at your tables. The running order for the evening will be, I'll shortly introduce Robert Mulhall from AIB, then we'll enjoy our starters. Uh, after the starters, I'll introduce President of the Chamber, of Dublin Chamber, Brendan Foster, and then you can relax and enjoy your main courses until after the main course, we'll hear from our keynote speaker, First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon. But first, I'd like to just take a moment to reflect on how lucky we are to be here tonight. How lucky we are to be in this wonderful facility, in this wonderful city, in the company of each other. Dublin has its challenges, and Brendan will share with us some of those challenges uh, in his address. However, when you consider the challenges that face other cities around the world, other business communities, other chambers of commerce, be it political unrest, um, civil unrest, economic decline, natural disasters, terrorism, when you consider what other cities are dealing with, the challenges of Dublin put in context are ones that we have all the solutions to in our own hands. With vision and leadership across all aspects of city life, be it government, local and national, be it business leadership, academic leadership, or leadership in civil society, if we bring our vision and our leadership, creativity, enthusiasm, ambition, and compassion to bear on those problems, we can realize the future potential of this great city. We spoke a little bit last year about what Dublin could be like, mainly focusing on infrastructure and what the future could hold. Tonight, Brendan will share with us insights and voices of people of Dublin. Voices that are not all represented in this room tonight, but voices that are very important that we hear nonetheless. But obviously, Dublin doesn't exist in a bubble. Our future prosperity is very much intertwined and linked with the wider world, not least with our nearest neighbours. So we will be very, very delighted to be addressed later in the evening by the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, who will share with us her hopes, dreams, aspirations and ambitions for Scotland. So at this juncture, I hope you enjoy your meal. I'd like to invite Robert Mulhall, Managing Director of Commercial and Retail Banking, to join us. AIB have very generously supported this event for the last 15 years, and we're delighted that they're going to support it for the next five years. Without their support, this event would not be the success it is. So I'd very much like to thank you, Robert, and please, ladies and gentlemen, Robert Mulhall. Thank you very much, Mary Rose. Uh, delighted to be here this evening. Uh, ministers, Lord Mayor, members of the Oireachtas, Dublin Chamber of Commer Commerce, President Brendan Foster, ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of AIB, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you here this evening. And as Mary Rose said, this is actually our 16th year in a row sponsoring this event, to which we are really, really proud to be associated with. And we're proud to be associated with, associated with this event for three reasons. The first one being Dublin Chamber of Commerce is a really, really important networking and influencing group that really represents all our interests at the most senior level of government and all other parts of the economy. And it really is important that we support that in terms of how we drive forward collectively as a business community in Dublin and the wider economy. Secondly, tonight represents one of the major events each year. In the, in the corporate calendar, where people get the opportunity from the business community across Dublin to really network, engage, and talk about the problems that exist within our business environment, some of the challenges that Mary Rose alluded to, but also to get an opportunity to build new business connections and create new business opportunities from that. And thirdly, Dublin is very important to us. From an AIB perspective, we have 53 branches across the capital. 
Uh, this, we see this as a huge growth engine for the wider economy across Ireland, and therefore our support into the Dublin economy is really, really critical. I'm delighted to say at the half year that AIB had sanctioned two billion in corporate and SME lending in the first half of 2017, a significant portion of that coming into the Dublin economy. Within SME alone, within the small to medium enterprises alone within that, we've seen a 13% growth year on year. It's a real tribute to the growth and the vibrancy of the economy and how Dublin is booming. Since I spoke here last year, AIB has had a momentous 12 months. We conducted the largest IPO in Europe at just at the half year in June, which is a really significant event, not just for AIB, but for all our stakeholders and indeed the wider economy. As a result of the IPO, accumulated with dividends and other payments made to the government to date, AIB has now returned 10.2 billion euros in capital back to the state on the back of the bailout that was put into the bank of 20.8 billion post the financial crisis. When you consider that 10.2 billion plus the 71% remaining ownership stake that the state has in a 13 billion market cap company, we are now in touching distance of repaying the state in full for its investment. It is of vital importance that the state's investment is fully realized and it remains the number one priority of the management team of the bank to ensure that that is done as quickly as possible. It was interesting when on the road as part of the IPO meeting potential investors, there was one common theme that really came through in engaging with all investors. And that wasn't about AIB, it wasn't about banking, it wasn't about financial services, but more importantly, it was about Ireland. The, the real, I suppose, belief that people have in the fundamentals of the Irish economy are very, very strong. The strong demographic that exists within, within our population our resilience, our ability to bounce back from conflict and from, from difficult times really is recognised that we are a leading light across Europe. And I mention that because those attributes are a function of your work. It is your work as business owners here in Dublin and other business owners throughout the country that creates that story for Ireland, one for which we should all be immensely proud and one for which we are all immensely reliant upon for our future economic growth. Also, when I spoke here last year, we were in the aftermath of the unexpected Brexit referendum result in the UK. A year on, uncertainty remains, but perhaps foreboding has reduced. And could I dare say that Brexit fatigue has started to kick in? Well, complacency is very dangerous, and we conduct an AIB Brexit sentiment index. And within that, some interesting statistics that I want to share with you. Only 21% of businesses surveyed have a plan for dealing with the fallout of Brexit, even though they are export or import-led businesses. We have seen from the results from our SMEs that transport and logistics and tourism have been the hardest hit sectors in the last year since the referendum results. Interestingly, two out of five uh, SMEs surveyed have only an importing relationship with the UK. So they look at the sterling impacts that have happened quite recently and look at that in a positive benefit to their business. However, in the future, in a world of trade agreements and potential tariffs, are they thinking long-term enough in terms of what the impact could be in terms of their overall value chain into the future? Our advice is there is no room for complacency. Brexit represents one of the biggest events and biggest challenges that's going to face business over the next 10 years. Businesses must, must plan for it. It is an issue of competitiveness. Our biggest trading partner is about to leave the UK. What will that mean for your business? Can your business absorb tariffs if they emerge? Are you taking the necessary steps to find operational efficiency to help weather that storm? Do you have appropriate hedging strategies to insulate your business from currency fluctuations? If importing from the UK declines, are you ready through innovation in your business to harness the opportunity in the domestic market that may result as a result of that gap? And, or are you thinking about expanding your business into mainland Europe? I could go on, but these are the challenges that business have to really get their heads around over the next short period in order to make sure they are ready. At AIB, we really want to be a partner. We really want to help our clients really deal with this and plan for this into the future. We've introduced Brexit advisors into our retail network across the entire system and equipped them and trained them to be able to give the kind of advice that we think is necessary to help our clients navigate these challenges. 
We're also running Brexit readiness seminars nationally, which we think is very, very important to ensure the awareness level is high amongst our clients as regards some of the challenges they may be facing. Staying on the theme of competitiveness, the digital economy is also disrupting previous competitive advantages that customers have enjoyed. You used to compete with the service provider or manufacturer down the road. Now your competition is global. Service standards are being set by digital disruptors. Customers compare you to Amazon. This challenge is real for SMEs, and too many SMEs remain digitally ignorant. This is something we have to address, and I really want to commend Enterprise Ireland's Innovation 2020 strategy, which really tries to tackle this issue to enable companies compete on a truly global scale. If you're not thinking about larger competitiveness, if you're not planning for it, if you're not measuring yourself against global threats, then you will be left behind. At AIB, we're no different. The reality is the financial services industry is being disrupted heavily by digital. That's why we're trying to disrupt ourselves. That's why we've put innovation to the fore around trying to make sure we are bringing forward services and propositions to our customers in a digital means that meets their everyday needs. We are in the final year of a three-year investment program in our overall business. We have invested 870 million in our operating platform, our customer engagement channels, our data and our use of analytics. That's why we can enable simpler payments for you and your customers through Apple and Android Pay. We now serve over 1.2 million customers daily on our online and mobile channels. We've taken 400 million of cost out of our business through this program, and we've been able to pass that efficiency gain to our customers. We've now cut our mortgage variable rates five times over the last two and a half years by a quantum of 1.25%. And we're applying that not just to our new business, but also to our loyal existing customers. We believe that's fair, and we believe that represents good value for customers as regards an important transaction decision in their, in their life. Alongside competitiveness and innovation, we all recognize that infrastructure needs to keep pace. Dublin Chamber of Commerce, Dublin 2050, provides the blueprint for this. We must invest in infrastructure if we're to cater for both the population growth that we all know will come within Dublin and other cities across, the, across Ireland, but also harness the future inward investment potential that may come post-Brexit. We must embrace the concept of livable cities, creating cities that meet both the work and life needs of, of people who want to live and operate within the Irish marketplace. That means transportation, housing, and commercial real estate are absolutely key. It doesn't take me to stand here and talk about the housing crisis. Clearly, there is no silver bullet for dealing with that crisis. However, lenders like AIB have a pivotal role to play. So what are we doing? Firstly, our real estate finance team have customers active on over 30 sites that have potential to deliver nearly 3,000 units by the end of 2018. We're progressing a number of large proposals and working closely with the social housing sector to ensure supply over the next 12 to 18 months. And recently, we announced a partnership with iCare, a not-for-profit organization that's really trying to capitalize on the government's enhanced mortgage to rent scheme to provide customers in financial difficulty with a, with a way or an option that they can stay in their home with dignity. Couple that with 35% share in the new mortgage market. These are just some of the enablers that we will remain focused on in order to help, in, in help, help towards solving this national crisis. In closing, you are the Dublin business community. We are your partners. We are only successful if you are. We are here to ensure we help you emerge from uncertainty. We want to help you by supplying credit and financial advice to enable you to create jobs and develop sustainable businesses that can fend off the competitive threats to which I have mentioned. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the night. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I know everybody's having a fantastic conversation at the tables, and it's great to hear uh, so much enjoyment. If I could have your attention for a few moments, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. And our next speaker, is truly a man that needs no introduction to the business community in Dublin. Very many of you in the room will know him. Brendan Foster is the President of the Chamber of Commerce for 2017. He's a partner in Grant Thornton, but many of you will also know him from seeing him flying around up and down the hills of Wicklow on a bike. 
Brendan has been a wonderful president for the year, and certainly to me as a new CEO, he has been a great mentor and source of wise counsel. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome President of Dublin Chamber, Brendan Foster. Thank you. Ambassadors, Lord Mayor Michal McDonagh, members of the Chamber, and all our invited guests, you're very welcome to this evening's Dublin Chamber of Commerce annual dinner. I'd like to extend a particular Irish welcome, a Cade Milafalcia, to our honoured guest, the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, and I very much look forward to hearing from you later on this evening. I'd like also to welcome back an old friend, Sam Maguire, back again this evening. And a new friend, Brendan Martin. I'd like to uh, also welcome Jean Gavin, manager of the Dublin football team, and Sinead Ahern, the captain of the ladies' football team. Really a great job, guys. Well done. We expect greatness next year. No pressure. Earlier on this year, when I became the 129th president of Dublin Chamber of Commerce, I had an occasion to visit the resting place of Arthur Guinness, a former president of Dublin Chamber of Commerce, in a small country churchyard in County Kildare. And when I was there, I was in a position to reflect on some of the great names associated with the Chamber over, two, over our 234 years of proud history in Dublin. Great names like the Jemisons, the Eason's, the Shackleton's, the Belton's and the Dockerell's, and some recent presidents like Mary Finan, our first female president, and the great Eugene McCaig, who has come here to this event on many occasions. I'd like on behalf of the Chamber to extend our warm wishes to Eugene, who has retired recently from Arthur Cox. Eugene, you've given great service to the Chamber over the years. <clears throat> and also recall another recent president, Patrick Coveney of Green Corps, a big Irish company with a big, a big player in the UK market. So Patrick, in terms of in, in, in the middle of the whole Brexit discussion. But when you think about all of these names and the families and the businesses associated with Dublin Chamber, reflect on the deep roots and the deep relationship that we have with Britain over these past 234 years. Not just based on our economic or trading relationship, but also the family and cultural ties that these two islands share. And as we move forward in a post-Brexit world, we are redefining and recasting our relationship with Britain. But I think it's important that we don't forget all of those ties, the ties that bind us, not, the, not what divide us. And I hope and, and wish that in the future we will be as close to Britain as we have been in the past, notwithstanding Britain's decision to leave the European Union. But who would have thought from this time last year there's so much uncertainty in the world that will impact on Dublin and will impact on Ireland? And after years of certainty about US foreign direct investment into Ireland, we're now less certain about the continuation of funds flow following the uh, presidential election last November. And who would have thought a year on post-Brexit, the certainty of the invisible border that we enjoy on this island for so, lo so long is now less certain. And what of all the turmoil in Europe, the elections in France, Germany and elsewhere, and recently the events of Catalonia, and the rise of extreme parties across Europe, what impact will all of those elections and all of these new fringe parties have in a, on a post-Brexit Europe and the relationship those countries will have within the European Union? And all of this uncertainty presents us with the hard truth, the reality of where we are in Dublin and in Ireland. We have to face the fact that Ireland is demographically insignificant on the global stage and that we're geographically on the periphery of Europe. But Ireland has shown great resilience in the past, and I've no doubt we will continue to be resilient. But as Robert said earlier on, we cannot afford to be complacent. We have, as we have these challenges ahead, we have to chart these uncertain waters, we have to chart our own course, steer clear of the icebergs, as we say, and remember that Dublin is the engine room of the Irish economy. And to quote the Shackleton family motto, by endurance we conquer, and endure we will. But what needs to be done in a volatile world economy dominated by large cities? Dublin needs to be a city of scale, 
Dublin needs to be a city that works, and Dublin needs to be a city that welcomes. But to be a city of scale, we must embrace urbanisation as a fact of life. We have to stop working against it and resisting it, but focus on getting it right. Because after all, global cities compete for talent now and investment, not countries. So to stay competitive, Ireland needs a city that really matters on the world stage. And let's be honest, there is only one candidate in this country for that role, and that's Dublin. Dublin is critical to Ireland's prosperity and the quality of life for the citizens of this country in the years ahead. So now that we have the National Planning Framework in draft, it's vital that it supports the growth of the city and other city regions, but Dublin has to be at the centre of this plan. So to move forward, we have to bite the bullet. Robert said there's no silver bullet, but Robert, we have to bite the bullet on height and density and engage sensibly with government, local authorities and the, and the city officials on what the city and county needs. We all know the scale of the housing challenge that faced Dublin, and for years now the Chamber has stressed the need for a greater density. And we will continue to participate, making sensible proposals with government and with Innes Owen Murphy and his team, not just grandstanding and talking about the problem, but presenting real solutions for Dublin and the wider Dublin area. But we need joined up thinking on, on residential development and infrastructural development. Last year when we were here, we talked about the Vision 2050 project, and we started a mass conversation about the future of Dublin. And during the course of the summer, we launched the Great Dublin Survey. And we engaged with over 20,000 people, asking them for their wants, their needs, and their hopes for the coming generation. And the survey was fascinating. We had some colourful responses, some wacky responses. I suppose, what do you expect when you ask a Dublin man or a Dublin woman for their opinion? But the underlying sentiment of the survey is that what people really want above all are the simple things in life. People want decent housing at a reasonable location from where they work. They want good public transport, clean, open spaces. After all, life is short. People want to spend more time with their family and in leisure pursuits, not sitting in traffic. But today, however, we have far off meeting these goals. We have a really long way to go. But to keep Ireland on the map, we don't just need a city of scale. We need a city that works with world-class infrastructure, the same high standards of urban living that we can expect elsewhere in Europe. So we have to get serious about capital investment in our capital city. And we have to be honest and acknowledge that Dublin doesn't receive its fair share of capital expenditure. It receives less than it contributes, less than it needs, and less than it deserves. So we need a new approach to infrastructure spending in this country, based on long-term planning, joined up thinking, and clear cost-benefit analysis. So we have the new national um, investment plan, it's a perfect opportunity for the government to get it right this time. At last, we're talking in cycles of 10 years, not cycles of one year or three years, properly thought out, properly funded, and the options all explored. But the national resources that are going to be in the National Development Plan have to be shared in a way that respects and reflects where Irish people live and where the greatest needs are, and that's in the cities and in the urban areas. And our other capital investment projects, infrastructure projects, we need to get on with. We need to secure this capital city's water supply. We're, we're fast approaching crisis levels. So the Eastern and Midlands water supply project is on the, on, the, on the board, so we need to get it done. We can't delay, defer, procrastinate on an interminable process of discussion. We have to get on with it. And notwithstanding the growth of Dublin over the last couple of years, where are the two great transport infrastructure projects that we've been talking about for decades? Where's the Metro North? Where's the Dart Underground? They're nowhere to be seen. These, national, these projects have a national impact. The Metro North would connect the city to the airport. The Dart Underground would connect the whole uh, national rail network. These projects have been talked about long enough, for decades, as long as I've been around in business. We spend countless millions, feasibility studies, etc., and we're nowhere near starting. We also need a city that welcomes, a city that welcomes talent and investment with a competitive tax range. Our 12.5% corporate tax rate is critical to our business offering, and it's our global brand, but we can't afford to be complacent. Other countries are doing the same. Everybody's looking at what Ireland has done and what Ireland has achieved. But the government now must need to look at other options to enhance Ireland's unique offering in other ways, to make sure that Ireland remains a rewarding place to invest, raise capital, start and scale a business. 
And in the Chamber's pre-budget submission, we've called for ambitious packages of policies to support businesses, promote entrepreneurship, and reward key employees. And now more than ever, we need to keep Dublin on the map of the city that welcomes foreign uh, investors, talented workers from all around the world. But a city of scale and a city of works and a city that welcomes is a city that matters, a living and vibrant city. And what a great city we live in. But these are Ireland's needs. And these are the principles inspiring Dublin Chamber's vision of the future. It's been a great year. It's been a great half year so far. I've still got a bit to go. But over the past year, we've had a new CEO, Mary Rose Burke. We have a new logo. We have a new brand. We have a new vision. And in case anybody's any doubt here in the room, and apologies to our country cousins, that's not corporate blue, that's Dublin blue. As mentioned earlier on, uh, this week the Chamber released its 2050 vision document. That's really exciting. And it, really, it represents the findings of the Great Dublin Survey and explores all the issues we, we talked about that face us in the year ahead. How the Dublin people will experience daily life, their leisure, their work and travel in Dublin of 2050. And the children of some of the Chamber staff joined us for the launch of the Great Dublin Survey. You'll have seen them in their pictures in the newspapers over the past few months. And here they are this evening. As Sam McQueen, Hannah and Michael Lyons, Tommy and Liam Cullen, and the girl in the blue dress showing off like our father is my little girl Rose. And Rose is here this evening. I ask myself, <laughs> having a look at the picture of the children and all the children in the city, I ask myself, what will these children and their peers think of us when they look back as adults? Will they look back at us and say, they made the right choices? Will they look back at us and say, they had a plan and they followed it through and they made a real difference? So what Dublin will our children and our grandchildren live in in 2050? That's what the vision of 2050 is all about. And before I conclude, I'd like to take a moment to share with you a glimpse of our vision of Dublin in 2050. is a city apart, a place of whimsical imagination. Despite trying times, its bustling streets reveal its flourishing charm. Dublin is written in the heart of all its children. The grey brick upon brick and the cream of its portal. It's the sun rising with the rest over Beckett and the water. Dublin is rich in history. No matter where you go in the city. The ghosts of those who tread before are never very far. Dublin is a city for those willing to spark epiphanal change. It is the crowning jewel in a modern Ireland. It's the key on the hands of time driving us all forward. Bright future beckons. To those who work for it, our destiny is in our own hands. Dublin, the sun that rises with the blue, a rise and meandering time, elevating all to new heights, cutting through the division. More than sight, you have vision. An evergreen metropolis, holding firm to its roots. Tree is always known by its fruit. The city wakes to a luminescent dawn, a technicolor neon that whispers through streets and Georgian facades, where the old and the new come to meet. Dublin is moving into convenient times that leave you speechless and make it a story town. Can't change the past. Ninyarka Kur Lakela. Giri Birch Bower. So let's make history together. Dublin. Bolya Clea Gra McCree. Take me there.
Take me there. That was the voice of a young Dublin poet. And I'm sure the old Dublin poet speaks for all of us with those words. A bright future beckons for those who work for it. Our destiny is in our own hands. But the people who can make this vision a reality are in this room. It's us, the business community. It's the national and local politicians. It's the civic and public servants. And it's the citizens of Dublin and Ireland. And Dublin Chamber will continue to stoke the engine of the ship as we chart these waters together. And as we say in, Dub in Dublin Chamber, Dublin is our business. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your evening. So the highlight of our evening is our keynote speaker, the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon. The First Minister is a frequent visitor to Ireland. We consider her a friend to Dublin. Nicola Sturgeon is a woman that's known for speaking her mind. She's one of the most visionary and powerful leaders of our time. She's one of the most instantly recognisable leaders across all generations. We're really looking forward to hear what she has to say tonight. And I know Dublin people, we like people who are forthright, outspoken, and tell us it straight. So we're really looking forward to hear from the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon. Welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mary Rose. Thank you to all of you for the wonderful welcome here this evening. I think the only other place in, on the planet with as many street talkers as Dublin is my home city of Glasgow. So I feel very much at home here this evening. I decided uh, about half an hour ago to pay a visit to the ladies before I spoke. Uh, and I've had so much Irish charm on the way to and from the ladies that it took me that long to get there and back. It is absolutely fantastic to be in one of my favourite cities in the whole world. It's always a pleasure to be here in Dublin. Uh, the good news for you this evening is that I am now, I think, the only thing standing between all of you and the gin bar over here. So I've, I've decided to be charitable and, and reduce my speech this evening to a mere one and a half hours. <laughs> that sounded like a nervous laugh. Uh, you, you, should, you should know that I'm not entirely serious. I, I won't speak for any more than 45 minutes. Uh, to be serious for a moment, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I thought it would be appropriate this evening to begin by adding to the many tributes that have been paid to former Taoiseach Liam Cosgrave. He was, I know, a giant of Irish politics, somebody whose life spanned the lifetime of the Irish state. He was foreign minister when Ireland joined the United Nations. He became Taoiseach in 1973 as Ireland was beginning, in his words, a new career of progress and development in the context of Europe. I'm sure that everybody across Ireland and indeed further afield today are thinking of his children and loved ones. Uh, let me also add my congratulations to Jim Gavin, the Dublin coach, and of course to Dublin for winning what was here, but isn't anymore, but the ladies' trophy. I think it's appropriate, actually, that the ladies' trophy is still here uh, with us. Uh, but it is, of course, uh, a fantastic achievement to win the magnificent Sam Maguire Cup for a third consecutive year. It's an outstanding and historic achievement. Uh, I hope you will forgive me though because uh, I've got a confession to make. Uh, my thoughts this evening are more with current events at Hampden Park in Glasgow than they are with recent ones at Croke Park. Uh, I've been very discreetly trying to keep up to date with the scoreline. Uh, for those of you who don't know, and I can't believe there is anybody in the room who doesn't know, Scotland is playing Slovakia in a World Cup qualifier this evening. We've got to win tonight, and then we've got to win again on Sunday night just to get into the playoffs. No doubt it will come down to some complicated mathematical equation about whether or not we, we qualify. But the last I heard, it was nil-nil 
Uh, and if anybody gets an update, feel free to shout it out. Uh, as long as it is a Scotland goal, please don't shout out if Slovakia scores. Those of you who know anything about Scotland's group uh, position in these World Cup qualifiers will understand that as well as following Scotland's match tonight, I'm also closely following England's game against Slovenia. Uh, everybody in Scotland is passionately supporting England this evening, uh, which I can assure you is always the case. <laughs> I understand Ireland wants England to do well too. You've got a match against Moldova tomorrow night and England doing well, I un I'm told, would help Ireland's prospects uh, as well. So here you have it, a truly historic occasion. Both <laughs> Scotland and Ireland are backing England at football. I'm pretty sure that has never happened before. And I'm pretty sure it will never, ever happen again. In some ways, it's quite appropriate that I'm starting my remarks, uh, quite unusually for me, I have to say, with some references to football. Because I know that the last Scottish person before me to deliver the keynote address at this dinner was Sir Alex Ferguson uh, back in 2014. Now, unlike Sir Alec, I'm going to try to stay away from divisive and controversial subjects like Roy Keane and stick instead to safe, consensual ground like Brexit. <laughs> Before I do any of that, though, let me say what an honour it is to address this annual dinner, the largest and most prestigious gathering in Ireland's business calendar. Now, I know that the Dublin Chamber of Commerce has been in existence since 1783, uh, when tumultuous political times back then, such as the end of the War of American Independence, were thought to require a general union among trades and a constant unwearied attention to their commercial interests. For over 200 years, that unwearied attention has benefited Dublin's business community and this city more generally. And that, of course, is something that matters deeply to all of you. But actually, it matters to me and to Scotland as well. I have lived all of my adult life in the great city of Glasgow. And so I see every single day the extent to which Scotland is shaped by the bonds that we share with Dublin and with Ireland. Those ties of trade, of friendship, culture and kinship, I think, enrich both of our countries. I've just come here from a meeting with the Taoiseach and one point of many, uh, I'm glad to say, that we agreed on absolutely is that those ties between Ireland and Scotland are not just stronger than ever, they are also now more important than ever. And of course, that's partly because of the shared challenge that Ireland and Scotland now face in Brexit. But it's also more positively because of the shared opportunities that we have for deeper economic cooperation. So the main message I want to convey tonight is that there are major benefits for businesses in both of our countries if we can build even closer connections together. As you might expect, though, uh, I want to start by commenting on Brexit. I have to say it's deeply depressing to have to start by commenting uh, on Brexit, but it is such a, an important issue for both of our countries that start there, I must. I'm sure all of you know that uh, Scotland is not choosing to leave the European Union. 62% uh, of people who voted in the referendum in Scotland voted to remain in the EU. And that's probably not surprising when you stop to think about it, uh, especially perhaps from a, an Irish perspective, because as a small nation, Scotland has been pulling sovereignty in one form or another for many, many generations. And indeed, if Scotland, uh, as I like to say, when Scotland becomes a, an independent country, that will not change. We will continue 
to pull sovereignty across these islands and uh, across Europe as well. So in Scotland, we've become, over the years, over the generations, very comfortable with the idea of overlapping identities, whether those identities are Scottish, British, European, Celtic, Polish or Pakistani. And the sense that small countries can be equals in a partnership of many is an idea that really appeals to us. And so in Scotland, and this is contrary to a point that the Prime Minister made in Florence two weeks ago, many people in recent decades have felt absolutely at home in Europe. And the fact that the UK government is committed to leaving the EU means that Scotland, like Ireland and at the north of Ireland, now faces a dilemma which is not of our choosing. We want to remain a full member of the EU, but we face right now being taken out against our will. And we deeply, deeply regret that. It's quite difficult to overstate uh, the extent to which we regret that fact. However, we believe that if the UK is determined to leave the European Union, it should not put ideology ahead of practical common sense. It should choose to remain a member of the single market and a member of the customs union. And in my view, that is the obvious compromise solution. You know, when you think of the UK, it's a multinational state made up of four different nations. And in the EU referendum, two of those nations, Scotland and Northern Ireland, voted to remain and two voted to leave. So finding a compromise would surely be democratically justifiable. And it would also be economically desirable because leaving the European single market will be deeply damaging for Scotland's businesses, for our universities, for trade, for jobs, for our very sense of who we are and our place in the world. And in addition to that, the difficulty of attempting to find solutions outside of the single market is becoming clearer by the day, week and month. I watched the Prime Minister's Florence speech two weeks ago. Uh, she, she managed to get through that one without coughing. Uh, and I'm hoping fervently that I managed to get through this one without coughing. Uh, but like many of you, I suspect, I, I welcomed many aspects of the speech that the Prime Minister made in Florence. The acceptance of the need for a sensible transition period was overdue and there was finally some recognition that the UK must agree a financial settlement with the EU and the high level aspirations that the Prime Minister exp expressed in relation to the island of Ireland were vitally important and also I'm sure ones that all of us share but regrettably there is still very little detail about how any of these proposals might work in practice. And partly, of course, that's because of the inherent complexity involved in trying to achieve the UK government's aims. As it's discovering right now, it's very difficult to leave the single market while also trying to form a comprehensive and ambitious economic partnership with the rest of Europe. But in addition to that, the, the government at Westminster has taken a remarkably long time to face up to issues that could have been and should have been addressed much more quickly. Issues like the financial settlement and even more importantly, the issue of the rights of EU citizens. And failure to address these issues and the rights of EU citizens is a moral as well as a practical issue. I feel very, very strongly that people who have chosen whether they come from Ireland or Germany or any other part of the European Union, if they've chosen to make my country, Scotland, their home, then they are welcome there and we thank them for their contribution. Uh, so that is a moral issue. <laughs> but the failure, even in a practical sense, to resolve these issues inevitably delays the proper consideration of the detailed technical issues that require to be resolved. And the impact of these delays is important right across the UK, but it is particularly important, I think, here in Ireland. There is widespread agreement on key aims, and that's a good thing, key aims 
such as preserving the gains of the Good Friday Agreement and, and ensuring that there is no physical border between the North and the South. But the UK Government's vagueness, more than 15 months after the referendum, still makes it hard to understand how these aims are going to be achieved. And that needs to change, and it needs to change quickly. I mentioned at the outset of my remarks that I'd just come from uh, talking to the, the Taoiseach, the uh, relatively new Taoiseach, and uh, I was reminded as I was preparing for the meeting that the first time uh, Leo Varadkar was ever eligible to vote was in the 1998 referendum that ratified the Good Friday Agreement. Now, I was, I was quite struck by that, uh, partly, I have to say, because it's, it's quite rare for me to meet national leaders who are younger than I am. So I, I was quite disheartened and quite depressed to realise that by the time the Taoiseach was casting that first vote, I had already stood as a candidate, unsuccessfully, I might add, in two UK parliamentary elections. Uh, talk about making me feel old. Uh, but more importantly than that, uh, that point struck me because it is a vivid reminder of the extent to which the Good Friday Agreement has become part of the fabric of everyday life in Ireland. It has been in place for the entirety of many people's adult lives. And it's the vital importance of that that makes it, in my view, so utterly shameful that so little attention was paid and still is paid, whether in discussions in the UK media or the Westminster Parliament, to the possible implications of Brexit for Ireland and for Northern Ireland. In fact, to my mind, one of the strongest of many strong arguments for remaining in the customs union is that it will make the issues facing this island easier to resolve. And so I suppose my first message to you this evening is this one. On virtually every issue of substance relating to Brexit, the Irish government and the Irish business community as a whole has an ally and a friend in Scotland. Uh, like you... <laughs> like you, we, we didn't want Brexit. We still don't want Brexit. Like you, we support the single market and the customs union. Uh, and like you, we know that Ireland's circumstances require particular and very careful attention. And we will continue to add our voice to those arguing for an open border. We believe that these positions are certainly in the best interests of Ireland, but also in the best interests of Scotland and everyone across these islands. Uh, there is one further issue relating to Brexit that I want to touch on this evening, since it links to the wider economic points that I'll come on to in a moment. The UK's vote to leave the EU had many causes, and those causes will be debated and analysed, no doubt, for uh, years, decades, generations to come. Uh, immigration, the, the fear of immigration, uh, often the distortions around the immigration debate certainly played a big part. But it does seem very likely that one of the big reasons underlying the vote to leave the EU was economic inequality. Inequality that feeds a sense of disillusionment and disenfranchisement among many people. And that sense of disillusionment, I know, is not confined to the UK. Uh, as uh, Brendan said earlier on, uh, John Simpson uh, was the keynote speaker at this dinner last year. And I was looking back at some of uh, his remarks when he spoke here. And uh, he said, at that time, making a prediction about the US elections, and I'm quoting him here, I personally don't think he's going to get elected. I really don't. Uh, he was, of course, talking about the American presidential election, and John Simpson at that time would have been expressing what then was a widely held opinion, maybe also a widely held hope uh, amongst some people. But the political events of the last couple of years have taken many people in many different countries by surprise. And actually, when you take a step back from this and think about it, if too many people feel too left behind by the status quo, if they don't feel that they benefit from a global economy, 
then perhaps we shouldn't be surprised if that is reflected in how they vote. And that's why I think political developments around the world pose such a challenge today for those of us who do support trade, who welcome immigration, and who believe that the benefits of globalization, if they are properly managed, should outweigh the costs. The challenge is to do more, much more, to build a fair and inclusive society. It's the best, in my view, that's the only way to sustain support amongst the wider public for a dynamic and open economy. So in Scotland, inclusive growth is already a key part of our economic strategy. Uh, one element of that is that we recognise that there is a, a strong economic imperative behind many of our key flagship social policies, such as expanding childcare or improving attainment in our schools. We also understand the importance of housing, and I know that's an issue of particular relevance here in Dublin. Indeed, housing uh, was one of the issues I, I discussed earlier with the, the Taoiseach. Now here, Scotland has a, a relatively good record. We build new homes at a faster rate than anywhere else in the UK, but we know that we need to keep investing. We also need to do more to make sure that work pays and that people who work hard feel as if that work is fair. And we are doing that in many ways in Scotland, not least through promotion of a proper living wage. We have a, a living wage accreditation uh, programme in Scotland, encouraging companies to do the right thing and then be accredited for it. And when I became First Minister almost three years ago, there were roughly 50 accredited living wage employers in Scotland. Uh, there are now more than 900, a higher proportion of employees in Scotland are paid the living wage than in any other part of the UK. So these are important steps and Scotland certainly hasn't got everything right. But like Ireland, I do think we're at least facing up to the right issues. And that's important. It's important from a political, social and moral perspective. And it's also crucial to ensuring that our economic policies are both successful and sustainable. If people feel let down by the economic order, they will reject that order. So right now, all of us have a job to do to convince people that the system works for them. Of course, Scotland, like Ireland, is never going to, to win from a, a global race to the bottom. We need to compete instead on quality, innovation, and high skills. Last month, I set out the Scottish Government's programme for the year ahead, uh, looking at how we in Scotland intend to do that. And given the transitions that we are going through globally right now, that felt much more a programme for the next decades rather than a programme just for the next year. And there are some parallels here to the work that the Chambers are doing encapsulated in that wonderful film we saw earlier to imagine and visualise what Dublin might look like in 2050. In fact, I, I was struck by a comment made by last year's President Derry Gray at this dinner when he was talking about that work. And he acknowledged then that nobody can predict the future and we should understand that more now perhaps than we have in, in recent times. But he then said, it's not about being right, it's about being ready for the future. And Scotland is working hard to make sure that we are ready for the decades ahead. You know, for example, last month we announced plans for all new cars in Scotland to be one hill. That was for Scotland, yeah. Yeah, phew. Cool. But just to put this in context, guys, right? Scotland hasn't qualified for a major football championship since I was in my 20s. You know, this matters to us. Anyway, back to the important business of the evening. Only interrupt me again if we score a second goal. I was talking about what we are doing in Scotland to make sure we are ready to take advantage of the opportunities of the future. I was talking about the ambitious goal we've set, that by 2032, we're going to phase out the need for new petrol and diesel cars. Uh, we're going to try and kickstart that revolution in transport 
uh, by setting a bold ambition ourselves. Uh, and that's important for environmental reasons, but it's hugely important for our economy as well. Uh, we already have really strong capabilities in lots of important technologies, smart grids, battery storage. And if we send a clear ambition to lead technological change, not trail in the wake of that, we'll better position ourselves to be the inventor and the producer of these new technologies, not just the consumer of them. And we're taking a range of other steps to promote innovation, significantly expanding our investment in research and development, for example, an area where Scotland currently lags quite a long way behind Ireland. Uh, we're also establishing a national investment bank to provide the long-term patient capital that businesses need to compete in the high-end, innovative, high-risk uh, sectors. And we're supporting a range of sectors, fintech, the screen sector, where we have big growth opportunities. And all, all of this, as we look to the future, we start from a position of strength. Uh, we've outperformed every part of the UK apart from London, when it comes to attracting inward investment. We've got a highly skilled workforce, more world-class universities per head of population than any country in the world, bar Luxembourg, and we're determined to catch up with Luxembourg sometime in the future. We've got an international reputation in sectors like advanced manufacturing, financial services, oil and gas, life sciences, food and drink, and tourism. And we have big strengths in some of the key areas for the future, informatics, data analysis, sensor systems and renewable energy. If you look at renewable energy, Scotland has quite extraordinary capabilities. We're home to the world's largest tidal power array and in a couple of weeks time I will open the world's largest floating wind farm off the coast of the northeast of Scotland. So we've got lots to be proud of but we've got to do more. This is a time to build on strengths, not rest on our laurels. And I firmly believe that Scotland, like Ireland, is well placed to meet those challenges. And because of that, and this links back to my views on Brexit, we want Scotland to be an outward looking, internationalist, dynamic economy. We want to export goods around the world and we want to attract talent from the rest of the world. And that is reflected in our approach to immigration. You know, we benefit so much from the fact that people, including 15,000 people from Ireland, have chosen to live and work in Scotland, and we want them to keep doing so. And there are similarities here with Ireland, but whereas Ireland, and particularly Dublin, are planning for a significant population increase, we face a big risk in Scotland because of Brexit that we could see a declining working age population again. That's why we're arguing for immigration powers to be devolved to Scotland so that we can have an immigration policy that meets our needs. And as well as encouraging people to come to Scotland, we're encouraging our businesses to look outwards. Uh, we're expanding our enterprise agency's presence in different markets around the world with a particular emphasis on the rest of Europe. Uh, we've got a new innovation hub here in Dublin uh, and we're establishing similar ones in Berlin and Paris. And few places are more important to us than Ireland. You know, Ireland is already Scotland's sixth biggest export market. There are more than uh, 100 Irish companies currently investing in Scotland. Many of you will re be represented here tonight. I thank you for the work that you do in Scotland. And if there are any here who don't yet invest in Scotland and want to, see me afterwards and I'd be very happy to give you the details. But these connections bring real benefits to people in both Scotland and in Ireland. Yeah, I mentioned renewable energy a moment ago. When I last visited Dublin last year, I visited the headquarters of SSE Electricity. And when I was there, I heard about their Galway wind farm project helping Ireland to meet your renewable energy targets. And Irish firms are helping Scotland to meet our targets. Mainstream renewable power has just been given consent to build a major offshore wind farm off the east coast of Scotland. And when that's completed, it will provide enough energy to supply 300,000 homes. Now, there will be occasions, uh, many occasions perhaps, when Scotland and Ireland are competitors, uh, not just on the football or rugby fields, but when we seek inward investment. 
But, you know, I think the opportunities for mutual benefit are far more numerous. I think if we can build much stronger links, a Celtic business corridor, if you like, that would benefit all of us. And there is certainly uh, the political will to do that. But of course, the key to closer economic links lies with all of you and with your businesses. Uh, that's why I'm delighted that the West Lothian and South Dublin Chambers of Commerce, who signed a memorandum of understanding last month, are both here in the room tonight. And we have a delegation here from the Scottish Chambers of Commerce as well, who are discussing closer links with the Dublin Chambers uh, as well. Uh, PwC are organising an event in Dublin next week to bring companies and leaders from the Scottish and Irish financial sectors uh, together. Several of Scotland's fund management and fintech firms will be there, as will the Scottish Finance Secretary. Uh, these companies will be thinking about the scope for future collaboration, uh, for example, in the development of supply chains. There are many, many other sectors where Scotland has key strengths and where Ireland also has important interests. Uh, whether that's tourism, creative industries or digital technology. Irish investors play a massive part, for example, in our food and drink industry, which has seen such success in recent years. In all of these areas, a sense of enlightened mutual self-interest will guide us to work more closely together. And when you think about our geographical proximity, our historic and cultural ties, and also the many economic opportunities, as well as challenges that we share. When you consider all of that, I believe that greater cooperation between Scotland and Ireland is not just desirable, it is essential in the years that lie ahead. You know, at the start of uh, my remarks, I, I mentioned the fact that the Dublin Chambers were established in the same year that the American War of Independence ended. Uh, the connections between Ireland and the United States are, of course, an enduring part of your country's story. And they're relevant to the quote I want to leave you with this evening. Uh, one of the finest speeches, in my opinion, given in Ireland's post-war history was the one delivered by President Kennedy to the Doyle in 1963. He was speaking at a time when, as he put it, modern economics, weapons and communications have made us realise more than ever that we are one human family and this one planet is our home. In that context, he spoke approvingly of Ireland's role as a prospective member of an expanded European common market. And he expressed the view that Ireland's remarkable combination of hope, confidence and imagination is needed more than ever today. You know, these words, as you read them back now, seem to me to be just as relevant today as they were back in 1963. Brexit will undoubtedly cause Ireland difficulties in the years ahead, just as it will cause difficulties for Scotland. But in my view, our anxiety about these difficulties must be balanced with optimism. Optimism about the immense potential of our nations potential based on our international reputation, our natural resources, and above all, the talents, skills, and abilities of our people. So my closing message to you tonight is a simple one. Let's work together. Let's do it with hope, with confidence, and with imagination to maximize that potential. Let's devote unwearied attention to developing the links between our two countries. And let's work harder to address the challenges of the modern world uh, and to seize the countless opportunities that we have for economic and social progress. By doing that, I know that we can bring benefits to Scotland, you can bring benefits to Ireland, uh, and together we'll bring benefits to all the peoples of these islands. Thank you very much indeed for listening and having me with you this evening.
First Minister, thank you very much for your words. I think hope, confidence, imagination rings true and authentically from everything you said. And certainly we in Dublin Chamber will continue to be deepen those business relationships with our colleagues in the chambers in Scotland to deepen those historical, social, cultural and economic ties. The raising debt of Dublin Chamber in the 234 years it's been here has been the social and economic well-being of the city. That continues to be our ambition where our hope, confidence and imagination that Brendan brought to life in the video where you saw the dreams and aspirations of the people of Dublin, the people of Ireland about their capital city articulated in that video. So we'll continue to deliver on that, but we do that together, leaders of civil society, leaders of business, political academic leaders. Together we can make our dreams a reality. This is your business, this is your city, this is your chamber. So let's all do it together and make those hopes, dreams and aspirations of the children a reality. Did you like the video that you saw earlier? Let's have another look at it. And that's the end of the formalities. Thank you to my team in the chamber. Thank you in particular to Carol Ryan, who, her colleagues won't mind me singling her out, did a fantastic job creating this. Thank you to our sponsors and our speakers, and good night. Dublin is a city apart, a place of whimsical imagination. Despite trying times, its bustling streets reveal its flourishing charm. Dublin is written in the heart of all its children. The grey brick upon brick and the cream of its portal. It's the sun rising with the rest over Beckett and the water. Dublin is rich in history. No matter where you go in the city. The ghosts of those who tread before are never very far. Dublin is a city for those willing to spark epiphanal change. It is the crowning jewel in a modern Ireland. It's the key on the hands of time driving us all forward. Ní an smuinimh an stáva dúirt. Brói fiúcha beacons to those who walk for it. Our destiny is in our own hands. Dublin, the sun that rises with the blue. A rise in meandering time. Elevating all to new heights, cutting through the division. More than sight, you have vision. An evergreen metropolis, holding firm to its roots. The tree is always known by its fruit. The city wakes to a luminescent dawn. A technicolor neon that whispers through streets and Georgian facades. Where the old and the new Come to me. Dublin is moving into convenient times that leave you speechless and make it a storyteller. You can't change the past. Ninyarka Kool Lakaila, Geary Birch Bower. So let's make history together. Dublin, Bolyar, Clea, Grah McCree, take me there.